Hello. Uh, good afternoon. We had uh, better make a, make a start, if everyone's uh, uh, ready. Uh, I don't think I've ever spoken in such a large room to such few people, <laughs> so um, it's slightly unusual. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I know this is going online, so I wonder whether I should have included a few of the slides I have, but uh, I don't, it's too late for that. Uh, my name is uh, Neil McHugh. Uh, I'm a consultant rheumatologist, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, autoantibodies and how they're relevant uh, in myositis. Now, I'm often asked what a rheumatologist does, uh, and it's quite difficult, really, to explain. Um, we obviously see patients with rheumatic disease, and that derives from a Latin term, rheumaticus, that comes from a Greek term, rheum, and rheum means flow. And for many years, it was thought that rheumatic diseases such as gout were caused by the flow of bad humours in the blood uh, to various tissues, including the joints. Hence, the practice of letting blood uh, in those days. And if that was not enough, perhaps immersion in uh, various contraptions to actually stimulate the blood flow. This is a four-cell Schnee bath, which you could immerse yourself with without getting undressed. Uh, and so we have come on a little bit since those times. And part of the room or the flux, if you like, uh, may indeed reside in these autoantibodies that I'm about to describe to you that are seen in various conditions, autoimmune rheumatic conditions uh, listed here, uh, such as uh, scleroderma, systemic sclerosis, and indeed myositis. And as I mentioned, these antibodies uh, are part of a circulation, part of a flux of the immune system. Now, I'm sure we've all had blood tests, and I'm just going to show you what, how those, uh, what, what's seen in blood tests and what we mean by antibodies. I'm sure some of you, I, I, I apologize to, to those who know, but I think it's worth going back and just describing this. And so, under a microscope, if you look at blood, you'll see um, cells. Uh, I don't know whether I can... You know, so uh, the, little, the red cells, the red blood corpuscles, uh, white cells, platelets uh, that are circulating in the blood. I and mean, then if you spin the blood out, uh, then you'll get... Uh, my laser won't reach there, but the, um, you, you'll get the cells floating into the bottom of the tube, and above that there's the clear supernatant. That's a serum or the plasma. And it's within the plasma or that serum that you have the circulating uh, antibodies or immunoglobulin. And we've all got a vast array of a repertoire of these antibodies uh, with uh, uh, the differing uh, uh, attachments on their end that can bind a multitude of different antigens, such as those on bacteria. And if the antibody latches on to those antigens with specific uh, receptors, then that uh, bacteria can be eliminated. So our immune system is there to protect us from all sorts of foreign noxious insults, events, such as viruses, bacteria, uh, all sorts of germs, pollutants, and so forth. And the immune system has two parts. There's the part that kicks in almost immediately that we call um, the innate immune system. And this, this really is first off in terms of uh, a fairly broad attack at, at uh, bacteria, uh, for instance. And so that kicks in almost straight away. Whereas there is another specific immunity called the adaptive immune system that takes a little bit longer to kick in, unless it's primed by vaccination. And the main uh, effector cells in our uh, adaptive immune system are T cells and B cells. And it's the B cells, these B cells that are the soldiers of the system, they make these antibodies that uh, defend us from, uh, will give us um, immunity. And here we are, uh, the, these antibodies are there to recognize this array of antigens. And 
normally uh, that's not a problem, but if the tolerance or to uh, if it's a breakdown in mechanisms of tolerance, sometimes these antibodies get out of control and recognize not only foreign but self, and in this case directed towards our own genetic material, DNA. And one of the first autoantibodies to be characterized were these autoantibodies to DNA or anti-DNA that are really a hallmark of a condition of systemic lupus erythematosus. So just to put you in the picture in terms of myositis antibodies and the timeline for the discovery of uh, autoantibodies and myositis, this concept of autoimmunity, um, and, and I hasten to add it's autoimmunity doesn't mean immunity to automobiles, as in the top right-hand corner there, but it was fashioned by, it was coined by uh, Paul Ehrlich, who was a famous German scientist, who described this term horror autotoxis, by which he meant that there may be antibodies, he wasn't known at the time, but there may be antibodies in the system that under certain circumstances uh, were got out of control, and there may be, must be mechanisms for controlling uh, this autoimmunity. Um, so I'll jump on in terms of rheumatic disease, and it wasn't until the 1940s that uh, Vala and Rowe separately described rheumatoid factor. And rheumatoid factor is an autoantibody. In fact, it's an autoantibody against immunoglobulin, an autoantibody against antibody. And it's uh, specific, reasonably specific, for rheumatoid arthritis. So that, hence the term rheumatoid uh, factor. Then if we jump ahead to 1948, and this is quite a nice story. This is um, uh, Dr. Hargreaves, who is a hematologist at the Mayo Clinic. And he was carrying around in his pocket uh, the bone marrow of a patient, um, as one does, I suppose, and <laughs> then e examined it under the microscope. And it's actually it, the incubation period in his pocket was actually quite important. By that time, these cells uh, were, were, were dying and antibodies were taking up this dying material and they were being engulfed by these uh, uh, phagocytes. And what he was describing was an LE cell. And you can see that in the center of that um, slide there. And for many years, LE cells became the hallmark or a diagnostic test uh, for uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. Then moving forward, uh, Eng Tan and others described an anti-SM in lupus. Often these antibodies are named after individuals. Uh, this was a Mr. Smith, hence anti-SM. And then the first myositis autoantibody was described by Morris Reichlin in 1976, and described as anti-MI2. Uh, and then going forward a bit further, uh, in 1980, uh, another group described these antibodies, anti centromer antibodies that I've listed because that was really the initial where I got into, interested in the, uh, in the field um, and uh, worked for a while on, on scleroderma and these anti centromer antibodies. And here's the timeline of the discovery of these myositis specific antibodies. And you'll recognize many of the antibodies on this chart. And note that really it's a relatively recent time, you know, the last 13 years or so, that we've really had quite a plethora or a, a, a discovery of new autoantibodies, new specificities um, in myositis. It's really been quite an ad advance uh, in, uh, in, in the field and only relatively recently. And this is to illustrate that uh, slightly complicated slide, but if you take a cutoff of 2005, on the left, this is juvenile onset uh, myositis. Prior to 2005, you, you would have only found an antibody in 15% of children. But after 2005, or uh, to modern day, you can find an autoantibodies in 70% of children with JDM. Uh, similarly, an adult on the right there, um, not quite such an increment, but nonetheless, uh, now, only 35%, and I'm talking about PMDM here. These figures are taken from a large uh, European cohort that we've studied. Only about a third of patients uh, don't have a recognizable uh, autoantibody. They may have an autoantibody, but we just haven't really discovered it yet. So I'll take you back to my wedding days, if I may. 
just to lighten it up a bit. And uh, I did grow up in uh, New Zealand uh, and did my training there. And then I got interested in autoantibodies. And uh, with our one child at that time, we set off for Australia and spent four months in Australia at the, Dorothy, uh, at the uh, Walter and Eliza Hall, which was a very rich experience as I was able to pick up techniques to measure some of these autoantibodies uh, that, I, that I used in, uh, when, I, when I came to the UK. And we described um, an, antibody, uh, an antigen called Semper B, uh, which is part of the um, centromere uh, repertoire of antigens. So, so, th so that was really quite, a, quite an exciting time. And then when we got to Bath, um, I came to these evidence-based uh, therapies for uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm not being serious, but um, different sort of uh, remedies or treatments for patients with rheumatic disease. Uh, I've been fortunate to work in this hospital, the Royal Mineral Water Hospital, the Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Diseases for the last 30 years, and it's got really quite a history behind it. And if you're ever in Bath, um, you should visit it. And I'm just going to digress for a moment, if I may, because... Um, it's quite a nice story that I came across quite recently, just to show that the RNHID did actually take evidence-based medicine very seriously going back to 1799. And it was a common practice at the time to use these uh, tractors, and you can, you can see it on this caricature, these little blades that were made, they were actually made by Elishka Perkins from Connecticut. And they got to Bath and they were made of a secret alloy of either um, lead or silver. And when drawn over the patient's body, they cured him or her of all sorts of ailments, from epilepsy to headache to gout. Really quite incredible. Dr. Haygarth recognized that this was uh, total, uh, was not, um, uh, people had been using it for inscrutable reasons. So he did a study. He did the first randomized control trial where he made fake tractors, wooden tractors, that resembled the real tractors and compared them in a crossover design uh, in five patients and came to the conclusion that the wooden tractors were drawn over the skin such as to touch it in the lightest manner and so forth and concluded distinctly proving to what a surprising degree mere fancy deceives a patient which I think is a wonderful description of a, the placebo effect, i.e. that if a patient individual knows, thinks they're having a real treatment, they'll actually derive some benefit. To get back to antibodies, okay, and to talk about the spectrum of autoimmune connective tissue disease, and I'm just going to, sorry, I'll go back. It is quite remarkable that there are different autoantibody clusters in each of these conditions, all right? So scleroderma has its own range of autoantibodies, rheumatoid arthritis, myositis, and so forth. It's really quite, and we, we still don't really know why, but it's very helpful when it comes to sorting out these different conditions in terms of diagnosis. And this is just to summarize some of the antibodies found in these conditions. It's a rather busy slide, and I'll come back to the dermatomyositis later. But you'll notice that most of these antigens now, um, or the autoantibodies associated with these antigens, really segregate with different, uh, these different rheumatic diseases. As I say, I was quite interested in scleroderma at the time, and this is relevant for myositis because some patients with myositis do have some scleroderma features and may, may even have sclerodermatous skin. There is an overlap sometimes between myositis and scleroderma. And moving on, these are the antibodies associated with scleroderma. Again, they're very well recognized, they're very valuable in terms of diagnosis and identifying subgroups of patients with scleroderma. And this is just really a representation of how, for instance, lung disease in scleroderma is associated with a specific antibody response called antitoposomerase 1, whereas limited skin disease associated with anticentromere and so forth. So we're going to come on to myositis and show that this is replicated really in, in myositis. Note down the bottom an antibody called anti-PMSCL, which is associated with overlap features. And a lot of these patients have an overlap of myositis and scleroderma. And another 
study we did at the time looked at twins, and these are monoidentical twins with scleroderma. You can probably figure out who's got scleroderma. And they grew up in the same neighborhood, went to the same school. In fact, they even married sisters from the same family. So it's hard, hard to really differentiate any environmental factor. Okay, but one's got scleroderma, one hasn't. So there's obviously a genetic factor here, or a mutation in a gene that's responsible for this condition. And also, we, we studied uh, at least three sets of these monozygotic twins, and in each case, the disease-specific autoantibody was in the affected twin, but absent in the uh, unaffected twin. Again, showing how remarkably close the autoantibody is in the development of the, uh, of the development of the disease. Whilst on the other hand, and this is just the other flip side of a coin, miners with uh, miners who, uh, these were uranium miners uh, from, uh, from former East Germany, who were exposed to massive amounts of silica. And some of these developed scleroderma, and again, they had a slightly different antibody response, this time to anti-topoisomerase 1. So it's a combination of these genetic and environmental factors that drive a very specific autoantibody response. So our journey continued for a while, and I was fortunate to spend uh, 12 months uh, uh, in US, in fact, at Yale University, I set off to try and clone one of these centromere genes uh, called centromere C, uh, which, and, and again, our family had expanded. Here we are. Uh, this is on our way uh, to the US. Uh, very exciting indeed. Um, as it happened, the object to clone semp C was entirely foolish and futile, and I was unable to achieve that at all. It really was embarking on almost a, a project that couldn't be done. Um, but whilst my family were having a good time and living the American dream, I was soldiering on trying to clone this gene that I never was able to. Um, but that's science for you. Uh, but nonetheless, why I came to, uh, to, to Yale was that John Harden was working with some famous scientists, uh, uh, Stites and Lerner, and they were done some, doing, so, had, and doing some lovely work characterizing um, the, some of the autoantibodies in lupus, anti-Rho, anti-La, anti-RNP, anti-ESM, um, re with really some very nice um, uh, molecular techniques. And what I was able to do was pick up some of these techniques, in particular a technique called immunoprecipitation of both protein and RNA, which later, and in the last 10 years, we've been applying to myositis, and it's been a really rich uh, and fruitful endeavor, because it's a technique that lends itself to actually measuring and identifying all the known autoantibodies in myositis, and indeed for discovering new autoantibodies as well. So that was, that, that was uh, worth, worth the trip uh, just for that, really. So we're going to move on. Uh, I'm, I'm going to come to, my, uh, to myositis, don't, don't, don't worry. Um, and I, but I've got a, oh, before I do that, I think it's quite important to realize that detecting autoantibodies uh, can be difficult. Uh, the assays are not entirely reliable. One does a screening test. Usually it's called an ANA test to see whether an antibody is there or not. This is a broad screen. It's not perfect. Um, it may not pick up certain, particularly myositis antibodies, but it's a routine uh, screening test for autoantibodies. But you normally need to go on and do another assay. Some are listed here. A very common commercial one is the ELISA assay, shown there. And there are other techniques that are a little bit more long-winded, but really, uh, the, it's a combination of all these methods. Some are, some are available in practice, some are still in the research field. So some of these findings from research in terms of identifying autoantibodies haven't really um, uh, uh, got over into routine clinical practice. It's happening, but we're not there yet. And we don't, still don't have the tools or assays for reliably measuring all of the autoantibodies that I'm going to describe. I think I might just skip that. I was just going to go through the principle of detecting antibodies, but I think that uh, we'll just skip that. 
Nonetheless, indirect immunofluorescence as a screening test is, is, is very, very helpful. And, and the pattern of, in this case, fluorescence, you see these, these are individual cells, some of which really light up, showing that there's an antibody there. So the antigen in the cell, they'll recognize them. Um, and some of these patterns can give you a clue as to what antibody is present. But more often than not, you need to move on and identify it with different techniques. Relevant to myositis, note in that bottom panel, JO1, that's for staining for JO1 on an, on an immunofluorescent slide. And in fact, you'll notice that the nucleus of the cell is entirely blank, okay? So JO1 may be reported as ANA negative, okay? So, so a lot of medicals, a lot of labs are fooled by this. Uh, because the, uh, the ANA is not a perfect test for, anti, uh, for testing for, for JO1 or indeed other antisynthetase antibodies. Two slides on lupus. You know about lupus. It's, a, again, a, uh, an autoimmune condition that affects different tissues, including children, uh, comes with severe mortality, uh, morbidity and mortality. Autoantibodies in lupus, there's a family of them. Again, they identify different subsets of lupus. Here are some of the antigens that they recognize. But on the right, I just, a lot of the time, work in the field comes from a different direction. And this applies to myositis as well. And it's really work of, uh, from Hopkins group, Anthony Rosen and that, and others, who helped answer the question. A lot of these antigens I've been describing are in the cell, they're ubiquitous, they're inside cells, yet the antibodies are outside cells. So how, how does the antibody get, how, how does the immune system get to these antigens to actually generate an immune response? Well, part of the answer is that within us, we have millions of cells that are dying all the time, I'm afraid. Our gut is constantly turning over. We've got millions of cells that are dying uh, by, the process, uh, by a process called apoptosis. And this is a very regulated mechanism, regulated so as this internal debris coming from the cells is not recognized by the immune system, okay? But if that goes wrong, in a lupus there is a de defect in the clearance of this intranuclear debris, then this debris hangs around and the immune system latches onto it and generates an autoantibody response. And Rosen and others were able to show how, and this is an apoptotic cell on the slide here, how within these blebs on the cell surface, some of these autoantigens um, uh, were located. So if you like, lupus is a condition of defective garbage disposal. Okay, I'm going to come on. You've been very patient. I'm coming on to myositis. And myositis, as you know, very well know, is a condition not only confined to muscles, but can affect other organs and tissues, particularly the skin uh, and the lung. It sometimes comes with this um, horrendous calcinosis, particularly in children, and other vascular phenomena, uh, 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 such as uh, Raynaud's phenomenon. I've shown this already, this is the time norm of the antibodies. And I've listed here, this is a list um, of, conventionally, these autoantibodies fall into those that are called myositis-specific autoantibodies. That's a term that I have a little difficulty with because some of these antibodies, some of these patients with these antibodies not, may not have myositis at all. They may have lung disease, antisynthetase syndrome. They may have purely dermatological dermatomyositis. But nonetheless, we call them myositis-specific autoantibodies. On the other hand, we've got these myositis-associated antibodies that are very important but identify patients who are likely to have an overlap condition with something else, such as scleroderma or lupus. So they're called myositis-associated autoantibodies. Uh, the next two slides are a bit heavy slides, all right, come with a warning that they've got a lot of um, detail on them. Just really, uh, for completeness sake, for those of you who may be inquisitive in terms of what these autoantigens do, or just to summarize that, in each case, the autoantigens in the cell subserve very important um, cellular functions like uh, in transcription, translation, uh, protection against viruses, protection against tumors even. So they, they, 
uh, they all play very important roles. These antigens that the autoantibodies recognize, and um, that's the same with, uh, these are some of the newer ones, but I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on this. And this really is a summary slide. It's been a well-used slide now. Um, we're quite proud, um, Zoe and myself, that lots of our colleagues show this slide in their presentations because it's quite a nice summary of how these autoantibodies associate with different subgroups of scleroderma. So I'll spend a little time just going through this. You'll notice in the middle the so-called antisynthetase syndrome, and that's associated with a number of anti different antisynthetase antibodies. For one, you'll probably recognize the most as JO1, which is the most common. But there are other ones that are uh, more rarely encountered. Okay, so that's the antisynthetase. And I'm going to show you a case of that. Well, I don't need to show you guys a case of it. Um, and uh, then there's obviously uh, the dermatological uh, spectrum of dermatomyositis where other autoantibodies, SAE is one that we uh, discovered ourselves, uh, MI2 uh, associated with skin disease. And then I'm going to also come on to this issue of um, malignancy and uh, dermatomyositis because it's been a major advance. That there is an antibody, anti-TIF1, that carries an increased risk of cancer in patients with dermatomyositis, and I'm going to come back to that. Whereas on the other hand, you've got immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy associated with anti, either anti-SRP or anti-HMGCR with statin use. And also, I know a number of you will also have um, 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 IBM, and in recent years, there's been another antibody discovered in IBM called uh, CN1A, that's actually misspelt on the slide, uh, CN1A, and, and, and which, which can pick up about 30% of patients uh, with uh, SIBM, um, but it's not as specific. You, you can find this antibody in other diseases as well, for instance, in a small percentage of Sjogren's and lupus patients as well. So it's not quite as um, specific. Okay, so, so just a few cases to illustrate how these autoantibodies help. Uh, this is a patient of ours who presented, uh, 2006, some time ago now, presented with um, increased... Oh, I'm sorry, I've got some questions. Yes, big, big your pardon. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't. Have we got a microphone? Uh, you can try to speak out, does that matter? My hearing is not as good as it used to be, I'm afraid. Do you usually just have one of the antibodies, or can you have, like, can you overlap on those oh, antibodies? Very, very good question. I almost planted that question because it, it's really quite unique and that's very, very unusual to have more than one myositis-specific antibody. It's really quite remarkable. I mean, there are cases. We studied about over 3,000 uh, or 3,500 serum samples from myositis, and we found about six who have an overlapping you know, two different MSAs. So it's, so it's telling us something, how the antibody is so much more related to generation of a disease. Not so, so much with myositis-associated antibodies. They, they tend, they can uh, occur with a myositis-specific antibody, such as Rho52, for instance, can be with an antisynthetase. Um, but the, the MSAs themselves are, are sort of mutually, which is why they're such useful tools for research, because they, they can identify genetic, clinical, environmental sort of subsets of disease, and it's giving us some insight. Any other questions at this stage? So if you have one, please do interrupt. <laughs> the large hall and format doesn't lend itself to it, I know, but please do. So just go through a case. Um, uh, so this lady presented with uh, progressive breathlessness. Six months after this, she developed uh, some proximal muscle weakness, the Raynaud's. Uh, I'm sure you know what I mean by Raynaud's. Um, some joint pains. I mean, had these puffy fingers with fissuring on the fingers. And you'll quickly, I know, come to realize that this patient presented with a very typical antisynthetase syndrome, all right? Her ANA was weakly positive. Um, her CK had uh, uh, 9,000, 9,500, and uh, the CT scan there shows nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Well, we looked for antisynthetase antibodies, but we were a bit strange that we couldn't find them. But 
um, we did find one. It hadn't been reported uh, at that stage. Um, and we, we reported anti zo one uh, which was anti phenylalanyl tyranase. It was another symphotase that hadn't been discovered, but we managed to run it on a gel of a serum and uh, identify it by mass spec. So indeed, she did have an anti symphotase syndrome. And these are the features shown in the yellow um, square there that I've already mentioned, really, and the different uh, components of uh, anti symphotase syndrome. Illustrated by, um, on the right-hand side, you notice these fingers with the fissuring and scaling on the radial aspects of the, particularly the second and third fingers, called mechanics hands, very typical of um, antisynthetase syndrome. And then there's an array of different anti-antibodies. JO1, uh, ten, patients with JO1 tend to have more arthralgia and arthritis, whereas some of the rarer antisynthetases down the bottom of the side are more often associated with lung disease. In fact, they can be the sole manifestation of lung disease. You know, the patients may only have lung disease. So the key points, really, were interstitial lung disease. It may be the predominant or even the sole manifestation of myositis. You have to be careful. These antibodies can be missed. As I've just alluded to before in the answer to that nice question, Rho 2, the additional presence of Rho 2 tends to associate with more severe disease. And these particular class of antibodies are, are, are uncommon in juvenile dermatomyositis. Um, we, in studies in the UK, we have found in adults an association with smoking. So it may be that you need a particular environmental insult that's not present in children to actually generate uh, um, these um, particular antibodies. So another case, this is a lady uh, in her 50s who was admitted with fatigue, weight loss, and an ulcerative rash, and rapidly progressive breathlessness, really quite severe breathlessness, no muscle weakness. Um, she had those investigations there, um, and had an antibody called anti-MDA5. Uh, anti-MDA5, it's only been recognized really in the last I don't, 10 years or so. And she was diagnosed with clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis. In other words, amyopathic, no obvious muscle involvement, but dermatomyositis with rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease. Okay. Um, so this group of antibodies has been more commonly reported in Eastern Asian populations and not so much in Caucasian populations but we do have patients who present with this syndrome. Rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease, so the pulmonary physicians should know about this. Um, and, and it's been well described now. They tend to have these um, ulcerations in the skin, sometimes in the mouth, um, illustrated on, in, in those uh, pictures there. Um, also present in children. Um, and children also have skin oral ulcers, and they may also have a tendency towards interstitial lung disease. So a very important group of, uh, of, of antibodies. And just, just a summary slide of children, because we've done quite some work in, in JDM in a large collection of uh, um, uh, a UK JDM cohort. And the main antibodies in children are slightly different from adults. They have a different prevalence. They have these newer ones, TIF1, NXP2, and MDA5, that account for about 50% um, of children. Uh, okay. And they go along with different subsets in children. And I just illustrated that, uh, how they have a different antibody classes identify different complications in children. For instance, this complication of calcinosis in children can be quite devastating. And in for antibody, anti-NXP2 tends to be the risk factor for calcinosis in children. Um, the same seems to be true in adults um, as well, although it's not seen quite so frequently. I think I'll just skip that slide. So I think it's important really just to cover this association between myositis and, and, and cancer. Um, the association has been known for many years that the risk of cancer is three to seven times higher in dermatomyositis. And there are some of more common types of malignancy. Now this risk uh, is, is particularly highest within one year of a myositis diagnosis. 
Okay, so it levels off after that. So it's within the first year that um, uh, DM presents. In fact, the definition is slightly more broad and that cancer-associated myositis is defined as the concurrence of myositis and malignancy within three years. Bottom line here is that there have been a wealth of studies now showing that this antibody, anti-transcriptional intermediary factor one, is a myositis antibody that comes with a substantial increased risk of an associated cancer, okay? Um, and just again, to serve to show you the case, this is another patient of ours who presented a couple of years back now with fatigue, muscle aching and weakness, weight loss, severe anemia, high inflammatory markers, all screens he was thoroughly looked at for, uh, um, for um, um, cancer. He had this anti-TIF1 uh, antibody and eventually a PET scan uh, shown in those slides on the right demonstrated a recurrence of a renal carcinoma. It's highlighting um, a section of bowel and a lymph node on the, on the bottom slide. So he had a recurrence of a previous renal cell carcinoma good end of the story in that that was able to be resected um, and actually he's doing very well his, and his, his, his symptoms have, have actually resolved so there's a, there's a good news story attached with it. And we've undertaken a, a European study um, and others have reported the same. If you divide, and this is a large European population, this is the first 1600 or so cases, if you divide those patients into uh, TIF1 positive and TIF1 negative, okay? If you look at interstitial lung disease, you'll see that, um, uh, in fact, the TIF1 positive have, have a lesser frequency of lung disease, but then if you go to cancer ever, the TIF1 positive group have a four times chance or risk ratio of cancer ever, and then if you go to cancer-associated myositis, it's ninefold, it's 20.5% compared to 2.3%. Now, the other side of this, all right, which is very important, is that notice that 80% of TIF1 positive don't have cancer, okay? So if you've got TIF1 gamma, doesn't mean you've got cancer at all, all right? The risk uh, increases as age progresses, and in fact, in children, this antibody is very common, and you don't see cancer. But the risk seems to be age-related, um, and um, by no means, if you've got the antibody, do you have cancer? But it just means that your physician needs to be more vigilant in looking for it. And in fact, if it's there, there is even a chance if it's treated, then your myositis will go away. Uh, so I think it's an important area and, and, and one that needs to spill over into, into clinical practice. So learning points, a thorough screen is needed in dermatomyositis, especially with anti-TIF1 gamma. It's a slight signal with anti-NXP2, but um, that needs a little bit more validation. And risk is high with age and in the presence of this condition we call um, CADM. And it's telling us something really, really interesting, this association. Um, and we know, because it comes back to this question as to how these antigens are recognized by the immune system. And for instance, TIF1 gamma, and shown on the slide on the left, is, is found in high levels in regenerating muscle tissue. And the same is true of some other myositis antigens. They seem to be enriched in the tissue that's affected. So they're there at the site of the site of a scene, if you like. And then there's a very nice study that was published earlier this year. Uh, and similar studies have been uh, published in scleroderma. And that this group, uh, a Spanish group, looked at tumor tissue from patients, they were able to get tumor tissue from patients with myositis, with dermatomyositis, who had had cancer, and retrieve that tissue. And they'd done some nice studies, and they showed that TIF1 was expressed at high levels in the, in the tumor tissue. And not only that, they looked at the TIF1 gene, and they found mutations uh, within the uh, TIF1 gene. Uh, and so it seems that there may be um, as a response, we all generate an immune response uh, to tumours as well. It's part of our tumour surveillance, immunosurveillance. Um, and 
in certain situations, that antibody response to tumour may then spread, and then the antibody might be directed or cross-react cross with normal tissue and muscle where the antigen is upregulated. So it's giving us a mechanism whereby uh, you get this immune response associated with myositis and cancer. You could even take that further, and it's rather speculative, but you could say that in some cases of myositis, you know, the myositis is the um, consequence of actually having survived from some sort of anti-cancer event, you know. So we're all, um, uh, but that, that's not proven. But it's t giving us some messages in terms of how these antibodies uh, may originate. Uh, I think I've just almost come to the end. Um, I'm just going to show you another um, uh, case. Uh, I'll go through this quickly. Um, this is a, a, an, an, another uh, male patient of ours who presented with fatigue, weight loss, dysphagia, severe weakness. And in fact, he had a bit of sclerodactyly, sclerodermatous skin, high levels of CK, and necrotizing uh, myositis. And he didn't respond initially to prednisolone and IVIG. Um, he was anti-SRP positive. But he had a partial response to IV cyclophosphamide. We treated him back in 2007. These days, we probably treat him a little bit more aggressively with rituximab. He, in fact, had rituximab at that stage and, in fact, had a very good response. He returned to work. Uh, the story is not quite so good in that uh, shortly after returning from work, um, um, he passed away from, a, from an acute coronary event. But it just serves to uh, attention of this necrotizing myopathy that can be divided into... Um, at least two groups, probably more, in fact, um, but certainly anti-SRP and anti-HMGCR are the two autoantibodies associated with uh, necrotizing myopathy. I've listed the different features there. Um, this carditis seems to be a little bit more prevalent and anti-SRP positive, and obviously there's this association with statins and HMGCR. Oh, and that was my last case. Uh, so I'm happy to stop there, just acknowledgements to uh, uh, my own research group and, and, and various uh, um, networks and collaborators that we've worked with uh, over the years in the field of myositis. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. I'm interested in um, seeing something, uh, how when you identify a specific antibody, how that uh, can then lead you to using a certain therapy. I missed the part, last part. Yeah, so how, how that could lead you to using certain treatments versus oh, another. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. That's, a, that, that, that's, that's actually a very cool. We haven't really got there as, as, as such. Um, I meant in terms of management, it helps in terms, I mentioned the anti tif one gamma, for instance, in looking for certain complications. Um, but there hasn't really been any studies as yet that have looked at particular autoantibody groups prospectively in terms of giving them a certain treatment. I think we're just about there sort of personalizing you know, therapy according to the autoantibody type. Um, but those studies haven't been done. We're undertaking a study in the UK called Myoprosp, in which we're, but it's mainly sort of an observational study, seeing whether certain antibody groups, how they, they behave, you know, longitudinally, but there's not an intervention arm. That needs to be done. I'd like to think that, um, for instance, we know that antisynthetase antibodies um, um, uh, identify, uh, and Dr. Um, Agarwal mentioned this. Um, rituximab, for instance, seems to be quite an effective treatment for antisynthetase syndrome in particular antibodies. So maybe you know, you'd be more inclined to use agents like rituximab for certain autoantibody profiles and maybe not for others. But that, that really has to be, has to be proven. So we, but, but we certainly do need to do that, yeah. Um, I have DM and I have the TF1 gamma autoantibody, you know, positively. I saw this article. It was posted on the TMA website. 
talks about cancer associated dermatomyositis. Does the PD-1 checkpoint pathway play a role? I wonder if you can comment on that article. I, I'm, I'm afraid I haven't, I haven't seen that article. I missed the last part of just the last few words you said. Oh, it's, uh, does the PD-1 checkpoint pathway oh, play a role? Right, right, I'm with you. Um, that might be Dr. Mammon's work, possibly. Um, there's a lot of interest in checkpoint inhibitors and um, uh, whether patients with autoimmune disease it might, may exacerbate um, their autoimmune condition, uh, such as my, myositis. Um, uh, but I don't think we know the answer to that. I think it's a very important uh, uh, point to be addressed and that you know, patients uh, um, who may be eligible for one of these checkpoint inhibitors, whether they should go ahead and um, have such treatment if they've got myositis. Um, but we... So that's PD-1, that's for PD-1. Uh, checkpoint inhibitors are um, antibodies directed um, towards um, uh, uh, PD-1, which is, which is a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, it's um, a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, it involves when T cells are stimulated, um, they need certain signals for them to be activated. Uh, and the checkpoint inhibitor, they, they inhibit part of that co stimulation of, of T cells. Uh, and certain tumours are reliant on, on um, uh, T cell help. And so these checkpoint inhibitors inhibit these, this co-stimulation of, of, of T cells that are helping tumor cells. Um, I was pretty interested in what particular cancers are indicated to... Um, I'm sorry, where's the question coming from? I can't. Oh, sorry. What particular cancers are... Um, uh, are indicated to produce autoantibodies? Are certain, certain cancers more likely to produce autoantibodies? We, yeah, um, there are certain uh, tumours more associated with dermatomyositis. Whether the, those tumours are more likely to produce um, autoantibodies, we don't, um, autoantibodies we don't know. We know that the antigens... I mean, pancreatic tissue, for instance, is one that the antigens are upregulated on. But there's a lot of more work to be done in terms of matching the autoantibodies to, to the tumour. Um, but there's, there's actually quite a, usually solid tumours, but there's quite a wide array. And uh, it's, not, it's not hard and fast, really, as to whether you know, it's all tumours or whether just a certain selection of tumours. And so it's only associated with derma and not PM. Yes, yes, the association does seem to be with, uh, with DM. Uh, not, not so much, I would say, with, with necrotizing, and certainly not with, um, with IBM. Uh, so the main association is with DM. It's a little bit of work, well, I won't go into that, but it's mainly with DM. Right here. Yeah. Actually, the first um, is just a clarification. Are you, you said um, that a person would only have one um, myositis-specific autoantibody, yes. and then yes. you could also have the associative ones yes. along with that. Okay. Yes. On your slide for the antibodies, you don't have like one for just PM, showing which antibody would be for just PM. Is there a reason? I don't have on the slide. Yeah, on your slide, that was that multicolor one. Yeah, well, we can try and go back. Now we'll forward. <laughs> oh, this is it. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a fair way on. Essentially, are there specific antibodies that are associated only with polymyositis? Only with? That's what you're uh, yes, that's the question. PM, right, okay, I'm with you. Um, so if you go back to that. Yeah, I'll try and get that slide. because I. Yes. There. Okay. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, I don't have PM, do I? No. And that's because PM is being subsumed a lot by these other conditions that we're recognising. PM, I mean, IBM comes in there sometimes, but more so um, um, uh, this necrotizing myopathy. A lot of the PM group fall into different groups. Some argue that PM as an entity is now, you know, quite rare. And even in PM, you, sometimes you can get sort of rashes and, and, and so forth. I, I could add a small box here for, for PM. We have actually described, I don't have it on this slide, another antibody called anti-EFI3. It's not published as yet. And those patients are very, very, very small numbers. Um, it seemed to have pure PM, but, but it seemed, seemed to have pure polymyositis. But the term you know, polymyositis, although it's still used, pure polymyositis is actually you know, not so common now that we recognise these other conditions such as necrotizing uh, myopathy. Okay. Um, my doctor has done an ANA test, yes. that antibody test, but he's never ran one for some of these, so if I were going to go back and ask him, yeah. what would be, like, what, what would I ask him the name of the test to be sure he could check for all of these different yeah, antibodies? It, it, um, so uh, practices differ, you know, in different health systems, and I, I wouldn't say if any confidence what your regional health is, well, because of different algorithms. But if you asked for an autoimmune screen, an ANA, and an autoimmune screen, mm -hmm. then in all chances they would, you know, the laboratory would do um, an algorithm-led check for antibodies. It would be useful, I think, if on that clinical information your doctor put query myositis, okay. all right, and that, that would hopefully lead them to doing as much as they can in terms of doing a myositis panel. Um, now, work needs to be done in terms of extending that panel to all the autoantibodies I've mentioned today, some of which are still only in the research you know, mm -hmm. laboratories. Um, and that's happening not as fast as we would like, because there's always a delay between discovering these autoantibodies and them getting out to be commercially available. And then when they are available, you need to make sure that the assays are reliable, because sometimes they can give false positives, you know, and that can be very worrying. <laughs> so um, there's work to be done there. But if you ask your physician to do an autoimmune screen, an ANA, and a myositis, you know, um, antibodies, that would, that would most likely do the job. Okay, so most of them are not gonna check for all the ones you had listed on? Well, on this it, screen. I mean, there were probably 20 of them. Yeah, I, I, them. <laughs> so. I'm not sure you get a favourable reception there if you are, you know, but there, okay. there are panels that would cover some of these just with a one assay. Um, uh, and th that, that would probably be the right way of going about it. I'd like to make a comment on that because I, last year, um, the lady that just asked the question, um, last year, my doctor ran a um, myositis antibody panel yeah. last year. Mm. And I go to Fort Knox, the military hospital, uh, and I brought that report with me here today. And the doctor noticed they did not run Joe 1. They didn't run oh. the in that, the one that has all the letters, then yeah. NMHBC or whatever it is. So just by saying a panel, they may not hit all of them. Yeah. I'm surprised I wouldn't take for Joe Wayne. I know. I did. Yes, it doesn't some, even some of these kits sometimes check they have um, a combination of what they call antisynthetase, all parceled in one. So they might look for antisynthetase that would cover Joe Wayne, but I'm, I'm not absolutely sure. But it'd be unusual not to test for Joe. But you might be right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you are right, but uh, I can't explain that. Well, I just have a comment on the panels. I've had two run. My rheumatologist in Seattle sent one to a Utah lab, Arup, Arup Laboratories, which has, I guess, a questionable reputation. Then he's, yeah. then I'm on the Octopharma yeah. uh, IVIG trial they sent yeah. it to the Oklahoma lab. Yes, yes, yes. I which know. has a, I guess, a stellar reputation. They confirmed. Yes. Yes. The one I have, they also 
mention the ones that I didn't have. Yes. But the first one from Arup had a huge list of yeah. what they had looked at. It was you know, like four pages long. Mm. So you should be able to get everything. Mm. And a myocytes panel should cover everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, certainly, certainly I know uh, we, uh, the Oklahoma, I know um, Dr. Targoff, we, I know very, very well. They offer a very, very, very good service. Um, research sort of driven. Uh, we offer a similar service in our lab for UK and Europe, but um, it's, um, you know, but unfortunately these not available locally. All right, I think we'll take the last question right here. Um, I also had the panel done at the Mayo Clinic. Yeah. And did I see on your slide, because I tested positive for anti-Rho 52. Yeah. So was I to understand that I have a, I have IBM, but I have a stronger um, likelihood of ILD? If, if you've got, um, if you have an anti-synthetase antibody, and I don't know, you know, I'm not sure whether you do, just row 52 itself. It, that, row it's, 50, it row, says SSA 52. Yep, yeah, that's row 52, yeah, or SSA 52, it's the same. Yeah, um, and the, 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 in population studies, you know, just in general population, patients who have an anti-synthetase syndrome and also anti-SSA, um, uh, and just, you know, tend to have more severe lung disease. At an individual level, that might not be the case at all, but just population studies have shown that uh, across, you know, that patients with anti jo one and RO52, SSA, um, tend to have more severe lung disease. Okay, I think I can't see any more hands anywhere, so many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>